Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Our Father, we come today and we thank you for all that we've experienced so far. We thank you, Lord, for the ensemble and the praise team, for the singing, for the worship, for the fellowship, for the giving. And Lord, we've come today to magnify and lift up the mighty name the name above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful that our Redeemer lives. We're so thankful, Lord, that you have risen from the dead, that no one loves us like you do, and that is so absolutely true. Lord, the people we've named and many others we could be praying for, we also think of our missionaries, particularly Rick and Becky Estes, Lord, and their uh, daughter Nicole, and we pray for their ministry in Ecuador. We lift up the Grace Brethren Church in Altoona, and we ask you to bless their pastor and their congregation. We pray for our nation. We know, Lord, that uh, things are so difficult. But, Lord, the world is no friend of grace. And, Lord, we are always going to be dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil as we strive to live our Christian lives. And so, Lord, you've never promised us a, an easy road. In fact, you promised us just the opposite. You said in this world we would have tribulation. But in you we would find peace. And we're so thankful for that peace in the midst of whatever trial we're going through personally or as a family or as a church or as a nation. And so, Lord, our confidence is in you and our hope is in you. And it's to you we look to this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the Grace Bible Church. And as we can again consider the importance of local church membership, we ask, Lord, that you would just encourage people. Lord, we're not here to guilt anybody. We're here to challenge people with the word of God, but only you can truly convict we pray that whether it's for salvation or for a renewed commitment, that you would speak truth into their lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this is our last in a series of messages on meaningful membership. If you're a guest with us, we've been emphasizing local church membership here. And even though there is no verse in the New Testament that says, thou shalt join a local church, we also believe that local church is strongly implied in the New Testament. We've seen that it's implied by our identity as believers. The moment we are saved, we actually are joined to the church, the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't like the terms, but they're the best terms we have, the universal church, the invisible church, only in the sense that no human being can see the whole church at one time. Only God can see his church at one time. But that universal aspect of the church we see in the New Testament, the emphasis is on the local church. And so we believe that the moment we trust Christ as our Savior, we should be publicly baptized by immersion, which identifies us with Christ, and we should join a local New Testament assembly, a church, so that we are publicly identifying with God and his people. To come to Christ is to come to Christ's people. We've been learning that. Not only our identity, but also through the imagery we see in the New Testament, we see local church membership is implied. Paul, we saw, uses the imagery of the body. He's the only one that uses that, and it's not found in the Old Testament, and uh, the imagery is so easy for us to understand. All I have to do is look in a mirror. Uh, the body is the body of Christ, which we've learned is the church, and we are members individually. We saw there is great unity there, but there is also great diversity there. And then last Sunday, we saw how membership is implied by ministry, and that we minister to one another. How are we going to minister to one another and fulfill all those one another commandments if we're not connected to a local assembly, a local body of believers? And this morning, as we wrap this up, we're going to see that 
membership in a local church in the New Testament is implied by community, by community. Now, if you know, if you've been around the church much or in the evangelical circles, you know the word community is a very popular term nowadays when speaking about the church. And the most common definition of the English word is a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. We talk about an ethnic community. We talk about an academic community. And many people view the local church that way. They just see it as almost like a club. It's just a community. There are people there who kind of are like me, and uh, we have some of the same interests. And so we're just sort of in a very loose connection, and we're, we're joined together in this community uh, that we call the local church. But we're going to see the concept of community in the New Testament is a far deeper and a far richer uh, thing than what we often think about. Now, notice this. The concept of community comes from the word koinonia, koinonia. If you go out these doors, you look at our cafe, you'll see a sign, koinonia cafe. We, we put that up there because of what the word koinonia means, and we're going to discuss that here this morning as we talk about community. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words has been around a long time, and it's a great tool if you just want to see uh, what the uh, Greek word is for an English word. It kind of explains it uh, to a point. And so when you look in that dictionary and you look up the word koinonia, it's defined as communion, fellowship, sharing in common, from the word koinus, which means common. Now, to make it a little easier for us this morning... The most common English translation of the word koinonia in the New Testament is the English word fellowship, the word fellowship. So most often when you see the word fellowship in the New Testament, the word behind that in the Greek New Testament is a form of or the word koinonia. Now, there are other common translations of koinonia in different grammatical forms that you find in the, the New Testament. That depends on which English version you're using. I preach out of the New King James Version, and it translates it as communion, contribution, partners, partakers, companions, communication. Some of you have the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, the NIV. Um, there are different translations would, would translate the word as sharing, participation, and partnership. So even in the way, and remember, when translators are looking at a word from the original language to want to put it into a language, in our case, English, they do that by the context of the verses around it. And so by the very fact that you see these different aspects of the same word, koinonia, which often in our English Bible is fellowship, but these other words as well, it shows us that we're talking about something more than social interaction. You know, when we think of fellowship, a lot of times, you know, churches have fellowship halls. We think about, okay, we're going to go back there and we're going to have fellowship. What we mean is uh, we're going to get a cup of coffee, a, a cup of orange juice or punch, and we're going to sit down and we're going to talk and, and share. And certainly that's part of koinonia. That's part of fellowship. But I want to emphasize the deeper meaning that we find in the New Testament. Fellowship in its most basic form is a relationship not an activity. And if you keep that in mind at the front of your brain this morning, that's going to help us when we understand what we mean that a community is a way in which the uh, membership in a local New Testament church is seen in the New Testament and certainly strongly uh, implied. It's primarily a relationship, not an activity. And even when it is an activity, it's based on the relationship that is already there. Now, we see that here in verse 3. This is, this is John the Apostle, and he is writing to the, the church here. So he's writing to Christians, and he's talking about how he and the other apostles have seen and talked to and literally touched the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 3, he says, that which we have seen and heard, he's talking about Jesus, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we have been learning that as believers, we share a common life. We share a common life through the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why you can go somewhere and meet somebody you never met before, 
even from a different country, that you speak the same language and you begin to talk for a while and then you sense there's some kind of connection here and you find out that they are a true believer, a born again Christian like you are because that Holy Spirit that indwells each of us, there's a connection point there. We share a common life. That's the central idea of fellowship, of community in the New Testament. The reason we are here, now some of you might have come this morning because that's habit. That's good habit, but I hope you're here for far more than habit. You're here because you share a common life with the other people in this room. We are New Testament Christians. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and we are brought together on the basis of our common life that we share. Now, the first time you see the word koinonia in the New Testament is very significant. It's back in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. This is after Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. We believe this is when the church age begins, the local church, New Testament church. And we believe at that point that the identifying mark was the coming of the Holy Spirit and particularly the ministry of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 42, we see the results of the Spirit's coming and indwelling these New Testament believers. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That's water baptism. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, koinonia, in the breaking of bread, which we believe is communion, and in prayers. So Dr. Luke gives us sort of like the basic components of the first New Testament church, the church of Jerusalem. They start out with like 3,000 people plus, but he shows us the things that they are doing which marks them different from the culture in which they are in. And one of the things that he says is fellowship. Now, does that mean they're going to each other's houses and they're meeting in the temple and they're having a good time of social interaction? Yeah, that's involved, but it's far deeper, far more than that. And the fact that Luke includes fellowship in the basic beginning of the church, it's got to be more than just socializing, and it is. Jeff Bridges says, they understood that they entered into this relationship by faith in Jesus Christ, not by joining an organization. They realized that their fellowship with God logically brought them into fellowship with one another. Sadly, there are people who will join churches and we strive in our, in our uh, uh, new members uh, teaching in our classes uh, to make sure that people understand this that you're not joining Christ by joining our church, that you're not just joining an organization, that if we are truly saved and born again, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and it's that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that connects us together in that we share a common life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Paul loves that term, in Christ, some 77 times in the New Testament. And that occurs at the moment of salvation by the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he places us into Christ and he places us into the church. And now you and I share a common spiritual life. Now, fellowship means sharing together in the sense of communion, in the sense of communion. Uh, the word communion in the New Testament is Koinonia, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, koinonia, of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. Think about that first church in Jerusalem. They were Jews primarily. They came, according to Acts 2, 5, from every nation under heaven. They trusted in Christ for salvation. The Holy Spirit not only indwelt them, the Holy Spirit baptized them, placed them into the body of Christ. Baptism cannot occur after salvation because there would be no salvation. It's by our identification in Christ that we get credit for his sinless life and for his death on the cross, for our sins, his substitutionary atoning sacrifice for my sin and your sin. And when by faith I ask Christ to come into my heart and to be my savior, whatever terminology you want to use, when I decide to follow Christ with my life and commit my life to him, and when I'm saved, the Holy Spirit indwells me. And I'm automatically not only connected to Christ, I am connected to every other believer. So you have these 
Jews from every nation, some of them are Hellenistic Jews, they're influenced by Greek culture, some of them are more what we call Jewish Jews, they're raised there in Jerusalem in the area of Judea, and they begin to learn the apostles' teaching. And as they begin to learn the apostles' teaching and understand exactly what has happened to them, and then we find out that they have this common life together, namely fellowship. That's why at the end of our communion service, we always hold hands some of you probably think that's a little weird, but we do that because we want to show it doesn't matter what your race, it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic standing, it doesn't matter anything except that you've trusted Christ as your Savior. We are all joined together. We share this common life, and that's what communion means, partnership, sharing together, fellowship, koinonia. John MacArthur says, when we properly share in communion, we spiritually participate in fellowship with Jesus Christ and other believers. It's much more than a symbol. It's a profound celebration of common spiritual experience. Now, notice this. Fellowship, koinonia, means we are in union and communion with God and one another. Union is the objective fact. I'm saved. I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I'm placed into Christ in the body of Christ. Communion means now there's this common life. I I have the life of Christ. So now I have communion with God like I've never had before. And now I have communion with other Christians that I've never had before, with other people who are Christians. And so this is the base, this is what is the basis of my, my fellowship. Now, often when we think of fellowship, we think of the communion aspect. We think of the sharing together or connecting with other people, and that's certainly an important aspect of it. But it is based upon our union. Look at verse 3, that you also may have fellowship with us, John is writing, the apostles, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. As Christians, we're in vital union with Christ, now with one another. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship koinonia of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The union is the the point of that verse. That's the main thrust of that verse, the objective fact of that verse. That that means we share Christ's life. That makes sense then when you move down to verses 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The one another here is in reference to our fellowship with God and Christ, not our reference with other believers. John is focusing in on our union so much more than our communion with him. And notice what John says. He says we walk in in the light, not according to the light. If he said according to the light, we're really in deep trouble, big trouble. Because according to the light would lend itself to sinless perfection. And the only way we could have fellowship with God on a practical level would be sinlessly perfect every day of our lives. Now we know based on scripture that the moment we trust Christ as savior, We are, in one aspect, sinlessly perfect in our standing before God. I often say to go to heaven, you have to be as good as God is, and that shocks people. Nobody can be as good as God is. That's the point. You see, many people are religious. and They think by joining an organization, whatever denomination or religion or affiliation that particular uh, church is, They think by that, they're going to now have fellowship with God. I got confirmed. I went through the spiritual hoops they told me to go through. I got baptized, whatever form, whatever. And now I'm trying to obey the rules and I'm I'm living in this, this organization called a church. And I think, you know, as I'm religious and as I'm good, then hopefully when I get the end of my life that I'm, you know, I'm going to make it. Lord willing, I'm going to start a new series starting next Sunday about being saved and being sure of your salvation and being secure. And we're going to talk about what salvation really is because I get so concerned for for people who might come here and think that by coming to church and by being a good person and being moral is what it takes to go to heaven. And that's totally missing it. 
You know, and a lot of times when you talk to religious people and you say to them, I know that I know if I die today, I go to heaven. They think you're arrogant. Why do they think you're arrogant? They think what you're saying is, I'm such a good moral person that I know God will accept me because that's how they view salvation. What we try to make them understand is, no, no, I'm saying exactly the opposite. I am such a hopeless, helpless sinner, a sinner to my core. There's not enough good things I could ever do in a whole lifetime to ever be approved by God because God is holy and he judges sin. And no matter how many good deeds I do, I'm still committing sin. So when I say, I know that I know I'm going to go to heaven, what I mean is I've trusted Christ. Christ lived the sinless life I couldn't live. He died on the cross and paid the penalty for my sin. And so when I humble myself and realize I have nothing, I can't bring anything to the cross. Did you listen to the words of the songs that we sang this morning? You know, it's only through Christ that I can be saved. So my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness that God gives me when I get saved. So in a sense, I'm good as God is in my standing. One day I'm going to be completely glorified. What a great day that's going to be. I think about my parents and other people in this church who we know were saved and went on to heaven. And I think of that wonderful verse in Hebrews about the souls of just men made perfect. They're not struggling with sin anymore, you know, and one day that will be us. But until that time, we live in this life. And though we struggle with sin, we can confess our sin as we walk in fellowship with the Lord. Now, he makes this clear that he's not talking about perfection. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's writing to Christians. And he's writing about the principle of indwelling sin. When you got saved, the principle of indwelling sin was not eradicated. It was dethroned, but it was not destroyed. Look at verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we say I, this is acts of sin. Anybody want to stand up and give a testimony of how from last Sunday to now, you've not committed one sin all week? Any takers on that one here this morning? Well, if you do stand up and you're married, I'll just have your spouse stand up, and that's going to blow that right out of the water, right then and there. Nobody who is reasonable would ever make that claim. So that's why we have that wonderful verse of verse 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Say, I thought all my sins were forgiven the moment I was saved. That's true, but we still sin. And it's now about that close walk with the Lord, that communion, because my union with him has taken care of my judgment on sin. Now, that means that union comes before communion. Union comes before communion. The fact that we share common life, that's what brings us together, our common life in Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit, but there is that aspect of the objective element to it. Though we are in union with Christ and one another, we are now to be in communion with Christ and one another. That's why we would read our Bible and we would pray and, and, and you come to church and we want to learn more about the Lord and we want to fellowship with him and fellowship with, with other believers. Colossians 2, 6, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith of you has been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So that's the other aspect, union before communion. Same thing John says, walking has to do with living your Christian life in a practical, pragmatic way. And thank God we don't have to walk according to the light. We walk in the light. What happens when you walk in the light? It exposes the dark areas of sin in our life, and then we can bring them before the Lord and confess them and continue to walk in the light as we draw closer to him. This is why Jesus used the vine and branch metaphor. We share the very life of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. You abide in me. What is true of our fellowship with God is also true of our fellowship with other Christians. Notice this, union with Christ and with Christians is not merely association. It is not merely association. Get out of your mind the idea that the church is a club. It's like joining a club. It's kind of optional. We're showing you from the New Testament, we don't think it's optional. 
We think that once you're saved, you should, and that's a clear commandment, be baptized publicly to identify with Christ. And then the whole tenor of the New Testament is connect to, officially, to a local New Testament assembly. Because to come to Christ is to come to his people. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful who, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his dear son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Going to church, getting baptized, do not in and of themselves mean that you are joined to Christ. It does not in and of itself mean you are joined to Christ. It doesn't mean you have fellowship with God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. There aren't many ways to heaven. There aren't many names for God. There are names for God, but they're all found in the Bible. The only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's very possible to be associated with a church and never be saved. Hell is full of religious, moral, nice people, tragically. Because they thought being associated with a church makes them associated with or connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about why community in the New Testament implies membership in a local New Testament church. Well, let's look at this. Koinonia expresses the need for spiritual fellowship with other Christians. When you understand the depth of koinonia, of fellowship, of community, it's union that leads to communion. So again, when I'm saved, the Holy Spirit places me into Christ, into the body of Christ, and the Holy Spirit indwells me. I have a new life, the life of Christ. Now I am to connect with others, and I would naturally want to do that. The Spirit would draw me to do that, to connect with others, and Jesus Christ has created the primary place of connection in that he founded the church. He's the author of the church. He's the head of the church. And the whole message in the New Testament is the local church. The whole focus is. And so that's what we're talking about here. Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We need one another. Yes, we are in vital union with Christ, and literally we're in vital union with other believers, but we need a local expression of that. We need a place where we can come on a regular basis and we can share together and encourage one another. J.I. Packer says, we should not think of our fellowship with other Christians as a spiritual luxury, an optional addition to the exercises of private devotion. We should recognize rather that such fellowship is a spiritual necessity, necessity. We've been saying that just like members of the body, if you disconnect one member, it's going to die. Doesn't mean if you disconnect from the church, you're necessarily going to die spiritually. If you're saved, you're saved. But we've been saying that a, a Christian who's not connected to a local assembly is gonna be a dysfunctional believer. God created us to be in fellowship with one another, in coin a knee with one another, in communion with one another. Two or three Christians working together can accomplish so much more than one Christian working alone. When Jesus sent out the 12, he sent them out two by two, Mark chapter 6. Paul went on his three missionary journeys. The first time Paul took Barnabas, Acts 13. The second time he took Silas, Acts 15. At some point on his third missionary journey, Timothy and Erastus joined him, Acts 19. We know that Luke also was a companion of Paul from time to time. Christians can encourage and admonish one another. Those of you in my generation, Batman had Robin, you know. Lone Ranger had Tonto, okay. And uh, that's not a good spiritual illustration. But, but certainly in the New Testament, Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and perfume delight the heart, and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Hey, hey, first century Christians. Already in the first century, there were people who claimed to be Christians who were forsaking the assembly. And I'm sure there were different reasons why they were forsaking the assembly. 
But I've never seen a growing, mature Christian. Now, I realize there are missionaries and people out somewhere where they don't have local churches, but that's not you if you live here. We've been saying that. Don't, don't bring that straw man up. You know, I've never seen someone who has access to a good local church who is not faithfully and connected, who really grows spiritually. Because this is God's plan. To come to Christ is to come to his people. In the New Testament, fellowship between Christians was centered in the local church. You cannot deny that if you read the New Testament. Koinonia among Christians, communion, fellowship, sharing together, partnering, focused on the local church. We saw Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Fellowship was in the DNA of the church from the very, very beginning. God designed the local church to be, as one author has put it, a family of families. Jeff Reed, a family of families. You saw a wonderful family up here. And we have many wonderful families in our church. And I know some of you are either single or your spouse is not saved and, and you come as you're, you know, alone. But still, you're part of our family. We're a family of families. We're part of the family of God. And we're part of the family of this local church. Note how Paul described the church in his letter to Timothy. This is the English Standard Version, 1 Timothy 3.14. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Paul calls the church the household of God, another powerful image and remember, he was writing to Timothy, but Timothy was connected to the local church in Ephesus. Many times we believe he might have even been one of the pastors there. So when we are saved, we are born again into God's family. He even adopts us as adult sons and daughters, according to Galatians and other passages. And where does that family find visible expression? Where's your family find visible expression? I would assume in your home, in your house, you know. Where, where you live, where does our Grace Bible Church family find visible expression? Right here. This building isn't the church. This is just a way that we can all, can all meet together. The early church met in homes. If you want to invite all of us into your home some Sunday morning, I'd like to see how that would work. I guess we'd have to worship in shifts or something, but we have this building so we can all come together and, and, and based on our union, we can have communion, we can have fellowship together. We can encourage each other and lift each other up. First John, if you read on through John, for John to be a follower of Jesus is to love other Christians. First John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. I like what Mark Dever says. Mark Dever says, for John, love between believers isn't a sign of maturity. It's a sign of saving faith. That's good. Love between, other, between believers is not a sign of maturity, though it is, but it's primarily a sign of saving faith. I have a real problem with somebody who says, I'm a born-again Christian, but I have no time for the local church. Or I can just be a Christian on my own. And sadly, sadly, that's becoming more and more popular in this culture. You know, spirituality interest seems to be up, but interest in the local church is not. Now, sometimes that's our fault because of the way we've responded and acted. But hopefully, as we correct that, people will begin to see the importance of the local church. How can we say we love our spiritual brothers and sisters if we are not willing to publicly identify with them? Like I said last Sunday, I really believe, and I may not see it, and I worry about my grandkids, but I really believe the day is coming in this culture when to be identified with a church like this is going to cause you some serious problems. Some serious problems. I mean, the day could come where you're not going to, you're going to have a hard time finding a job because, you know, this whole homosexual movement and, and this whole push to take away tax exempt status from churches because we hold to the biblical view on morality, whether it's homosexuality or, or any other brand of morality, this whole gender nonsense and whatever. I just think the day could come when it could really cost you. It's not going to be your political affiliation, it's going to be your local church affiliation. And how many members? 
what we have at that time. Lastly, this is a fellowship koinonia of purpose, a fellowship, a koinonia of purpose. Philippians chapter 1, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship, koinonia, in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, we tend to think of fellowship primarily in social interaction and sometimes, as I preached last Sunday, in mutual ministry. And that's certainly important. 1 Thessalonians 5, therefore, comfort each other, edify one another, just as you also are doing. We come to church, and, and it's a benefit to us. And there are times where we're the hurting person, and we need somebody to come, come to us and encourage us. And other times, we're going to be the encourager, and we're going to be the comforter. And so we need one another, and we need that mutual ministry. We've been emphasizing that. But, you know, we're part of something far, far greater than just ourselves and our needs and being ministered to. And that's what we see Paul writing about here. Your fellowship in the gospel. The English Standard Version says your partnership in the gospel. The New American Standard Bible says your participation in the gospel. Paul saw the Christians of Philippi as actually participating with him, partnering with him in all of his missionary endeavors. And how many of those Christians in those, that church do you think actually went with Paul? Not that many, if any. And yet Paul says, look, you are partnering with me in my my missionary endeavors, in the gospel, in getting the gospel out. This partnership is so essential today. And they realized they weren't just partnering with a person. It wasn't just Paul. It was the spread of the gospel. And how did they do that? They did that through prayer. They did that through financial support. They did that through the encouragement of the apostle Paul and supporting him in so many ways. And we have that opportunity as well. You know, our church is very mission-minded and all the missionaries and mission agencies we support, let alone the special projects. We still have those two going on. We haven't met those goals yet this year and all those things that we attempt to do in our outreach with Operation Christmas Child and And even with the bags the seniors are doing and all kinds of different things that we try to reach our community and reach around the world. So what a great opportunity to be part of something that's going to outlive us much more in this life and it's going to make a difference for eternity. Fellowship, koinonia, community in and through the local church is a working relationship. It's a working relationship. I alluded to that last Sunday in our message on ministry. Find a ministry, get your gift, plug in, be useful, get out of the 80%, slide over into the 20%. Let's get that 20% up and get going and higher and higher. But not only that, that we can partner together in a working relationship to get the gospel out. Not only in this community and in this state and in this country, but literally around the world. And when you view the local church that way, it sure gives you a different perspective Why I get up on Sunday, I know I get up Sunday morning, come to church, it's my job, I get that, okay. But why I would get up if I wasn't pastoring and get up and come to church and get involved and get connected as a Christian, it's my obligation and it's my great, great privilege. Father, we pray that you would continue to speak to hearts today. Lord, I pray for some that might be here and they think by the the fact that they join a religious organization, they're right with God. And yet, Lord, may you help them to see how can some water, whether it's sprinkled on me or I'm, dumped, I'm dipped in it, how could doing some good deeds and giving some money make up for all the sin that I've committed? How in the world could that satisfy the righteous, holy, just anger of a holy, loving God? Lord, may they understand that Christ is the only way I pray they would learn that their hope can only be built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And to trust in anything else is totally and completely empty and vain and hopeless. But thank you for the great hope we have in Christ. Thank you for this local church. I pray, the Lord, that you would speak to some who have not seen the need for membership or if they can't find that here, maybe you sh- I pray you would lead them to another church where maybe they could find that connection because it is so vital. It's so important. 
So bless us, Lord, as we close this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand?